You know, this, sometimes I get, well, let me read you the scripture first. And let me, let me look it up. I know it's in Matthew. It's in Matthew 10, 29. It's um, one of everybody's favorite verses and uh, for very good reason. Um, should have marked it, but you know, you know how it is. Well, it's not in this Bible. Just a moment. Matthew 10, 29. You thought I was joking about it not being in here, didn't you? Here it is. So do not be afraid of them, for there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, you speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roofs. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both the soul and the body in hell. Listen, are not two sparrows sold for a penny, yet not one of them will fall to the ground without your father's knowledge. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. I like that line. <laughs> what are we worth? We're worth more than many sparrows. We used to have a member of this church, Raleigh Yorth, an older gentleman all the time he was here. <laughs> he hated sparrows. I have a particular affection for sparrows because our Lord used it in this passage, but he hated sparrows and spent all the time he could in his backyard trying to kill them. So when our Lord says, you are worth many sparrows, Raleigh said, well, you're still not worth anything because a sparrow ain't worth nothing. But um, our Lord said they're worth a little bit, and we're worth many times that, which is one of his more humorous sayings, even though he meant it very seriously. And we have the song, His Eye is on the Sparrow, which we're going to sing uh, congregationally after the sermon. And this will be the first time in all of my years of ministry that uh, I have ever, we have ever sung this song congregationally. It's always been a solo. And actually, I have never been in church anywhere in all of my born put-togethers in which we sang His Eye is on the Sparrow as a congregational hymn because we always think of it as a solo hymn. But it's put in the book to be a congregational hymn. Uh, it's not in our book right now, but I pulled it from uh, an old hymn book uh, for us to sing, to sing today. We talked last week about the fact that God has given us freedom. This is the great achievement that God has uh, accomplished with this world. We are here in this world, and God has, <laughs> has given us freedom uh, to make our own choices, uh, which uh, may have been a mistake on God's part. I don't know. Actually, the truth is God doesn't make any mistakes. We're here with a purpose. We're here to learn to think and to love and to grow in grace and understanding. And we're here with our freedom. But I'm going to repeat a story that we shared not long ago. My sister and I are head over heels into this near-death experience thing right now because she's teaching that course and I help a little bit with it on near-death experiences. And so we have, uh, we have near-death experiences on our mind. And I shared one with you from a woman whose name is, um, uh, I'm talking to my sister, who is the th Rosemary Thornton. Rosemary Thornton is the one who had a, an experience. And um, she had a tragedy in here. I, I talked about this just two weeks ago, so it's coming right back at you. My expectation is that you do not remember the sermon 
by the time you get to the car, all right? So I, I, can, I can talk about it again, but it's been on my mind because uh, Rosemary Thornton had an experience in which there was a surgical mistake uh, that uh, nearly killed her. She was bleeding to death. She had gone in for a biopsy to checking for cancer, and uh, they made a, the doctors made a mistake. When she went in, there was a nurse. She said to the nurse, they said to the nurse, don't let me die. And the nurse said, honey, we're not going to let you die. The nurse made her that promise. Well, anyway, she did die. She bled out, and she died, and her heart stopped, and she had an extraordinary experience. She had already, she had already been suffering so because two years before that, for no fault of her own, she and her husband both loved each other dearly, but her husband had been extremely depressed and he had committed suicide and she had been in a kind of hell of uh, remorse and guilt and, and, and regret ever since then. She had not known what to do with her own life. She could not move forward because this great sorrow was hanging over her. And... Uh, when she died, she found herself in this white room, and there was some divine being there with her. Now, you're going to remember a little bit about this, I think, if you were here or if you heard it online. And in this white room, there was a door, and she knew what that door was because she had spent a lot of her time uh, studying near-death experiences. She was a Christian and she knew that there was life after death, and she knew what that door represented. She knew it was the demarcation, uh, and if she went through that door, she knew that she would not be returning to this world. She said, looking at this door in this white room, there, there was really no decision for me to make, it seemed, because... <laughs> I had endured two years of isolation, loneliness, self-loathing, guilt, regret, emotional agony, spiritual disappointment, crippling physical pain, loss of everything and almost everyone, and more. And now God was offering me a chance to return to my true home. Everything within me knew that I was now going to have the greatest opportunity of my life. I was going to be going home. But as I moved closer to that door, the spiritual companion was right there with me. And those tiny sparkling droplets of light were all around me. And I tried to stop and put together a simple question. I asked, is this divine? That's not what I really wanted to ask. I was trying to ask, is this God's divine plan for my life, that a medical mistake ends my life. But somehow, in my great excitement, I could only get out the first three words, and after I had uttered those first three words, is this divine, before I could even finish, the answer came with an infusion of understanding. And this is what I was told word for word. No. This is not God's will for your life. But this is now your choice. It's your choice. God has given us freedom. We have that freedom. We can make it here. Make our choices here. We can make our choices there. But it's your choice. And you can go on or you can return. And whatever you decide, whichever path you choose, you will go with all of God's love and care and mercy and grace and blessing. Neither decision will be a wrong decision. Either way, you will be richly blessed.
Well, that made it easy for her. So <laughs> she reached over to push the door open. But then, now, what I'm talking about today is the fact that we've got this freedom, but this freedom is somehow limited because God has a will for our life. And God can be pushy. God can, uh, God is seeking us. Remember our Lord's story about the lost sheep. He's always out to get us. And it's not an, it's not an even balance because God has all the power. We're free, yes, but we're free in the way my grandmama, my mother's mother used to give us freedom when we were children. I remember being held in her lap. But sometimes she didn't hold me against her in her lap. She would put her arms out like this. Give me a place to move around within. And then I would come up against this barrier, which were her arms of love, okay? So I had freedom, yes. But I had freedom within a, <laughs> a limited circumference. And this is true in life. Now, there are some people who are intent on breaking through that circumference and going into those places that are, are farther away from God. And there are consequences to that. But within this place of love that we are held, we have freedom, but we also have God working to lead us, to teach us, to encourage us, to draw us in the right way. So she reached for that door. But just the moment she reached for that door, since, by the way, who is the one who has power here? It is God. She suddenly had an image of that woman that she had promised, that nurse that she had promised, that had promised her that she would not die. And the nurse was sitting in an outer room. Her body lay still on the operating table. She was at that moment dead, and the nurse was crying. And she said to herself, ah, the nurse will get over it. So what did she do? She reached for that door again because she knew on the other side of that door was everything that she felt she had lost in life. There was joy. There was comfort. There was ease, something she hadn't experienced in two years. And in fact, she hadn't experienced a lot of it in her whole life if she could just go through that door. So she reaches for it again. And then, though, instead of just seeing the woman, she was feeling everything the woman was feeling. Why was this happening? Because it was God's will that she not go through the door. And he said, and she had been told by this angelic being, this is entirely your choice and God's going to love you no matter what you do. And then she's hit with these two images, which are too much for her. She's felt this woman's pain and said, I'm going to ruin her life. I can't do that to her, so I'm not going to go through the door. And in that moment, she found herself back on the hospital bed. Her heart was beating again, and she was going again. We have freedom, but God has a will for us. I'm really talking today about God's interventions in our life. I've been interested a long time in um, <laughs> in a in a fellow named Hugh Montefiore, Hugh Montefiore. Um, he is here somewhere in this stack of papers. Here he is, right here. He was a bishop in the Church of England, all right? Um, he knew nothing about Christianity when he was growing up because he was Jewish, a Jewish kid. He came from two uh, really uh, prominent, high-class Jewish uh, families. 
both uh, quite wealthy who were joined together in his mom and dad. Um, they had nothing to do with Christianity. He said he, he believed that he probably had absolutely zero Gentile DNA in his whole body. Um, he was as Jewish as you could get. And uh, he knew nothing at all about Christianity. He, 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 he was around Christians. He had never been to a Christian service. He went to a what the English call a public school, but it's not a public school over there. If it's a public school, it's actually a private school. He went to this, this um, uh, high-class private school over there uh, where all the kids were wealthy. It was a boys' school, only boys. And... Uh, uh, they were all except two kids in the school were, were were Gentile. There were two Jewish kids in the school, and uh, he had never had any opportunity to learn about any other faith because uh, his family was as Jewish as you get. But I'm going to read what happened to him when he was uh, 17 years old, 16. He said, "I was 16 years old at the time." This was, by the way, back in 19. 36, uh, Hugh Montefiore, Bishop of the English Church, died in 2005. Um, it was about five o'clock on a wintry afternoon in 1936. I was sitting alone in my study in the schoolhouse at rugby school. Said it was really more like a cubicle that was assigned to him. All of the boys, he said, had similar cubicles. What happened then determined the whole future pattern of my life. I was, as I remember, indulging in a rather pleasant adolescent gloom. I suddenly became aware of a figure in white whom I saw clearly in my mind's eye. I use this expression because I'm pretty sure that if somebody had come by to take a camera and take a photograph, they would have found nothing on it. And from this figure, I heard the words, follow me. Instinctively, I knew that this was Jesus. Heaven knows how I knew that. I knew nothing about him. Put like that, it seconds somewhat here. In fact, it was an end of, uh, put like that in seconds, it may not seem like much, but it was in truth an incredibly rich event that filled me afterwards with overwhelming joy. Now, there's a word that comes up so often in experiences joy. And often the word goes beyond joy and is called ecstasy. I could do no other thing than follow those instructions. <laughs> I found that I had become a Christian as a result of a totally unexpected and most unusual spiritual experience. Although that was not, not how I would have put it at that time. I was aware of the living Christ. And because of that, I was aware of God in a new way. People ask me, why and when did I decide to convert? I did not decide at all, he said. It was decided for me. And here he was, this 16-year-old, Jewish kid without an ounce of Gentile DNA in his body. And Jesus appeared to him clearly and said, follow me. Well, he said, I had to tell the headmaster and said the headmaster was very kind. But he said, then I had to tell my parents. He said, that was very, very difficult but they were understanding and they were, they were loving. 
He did not end up being estranged from his parents, but he knew then what his vocation in life would be. He entered the Church of England. He said he knew nothing about the Church of England or the Catholic Church or the Methodist Church or the Presbyterian Church or any other church, but he was English, so he thought he ought to join the Church of England. Okay, that's all he knew about it. He began to read the Gospels, and he was just filled with wonder before this Jesus that he had already met. And he spent his whole life proclaiming him. We are free. We are free to decide. But God is out to get us. Do you ever feel it? Do you ever do things and think, ah, does God want me doing that? Does God want me thinking that? Because God is always pushing in. We have a will and we have a free will, but God, God has a will for us also. We pray it every Sunday. Lord, let thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let's get real brave. I did it last night. It may not be brave for you, but for me, it took some bravery. I'm, I'm ashamed to tell you that. I was um, talking to God, and I said, God, and God, I'm saying it again, you hear me? Let your will be done in my life. Do you realize that nothing in the world better could happen to us than having God's will done in our life? We're free to decide. We can do what we want to. But the most wonderful thing that could happen to us is having God's will done in our lives. Lord, help us ask you for that. Amen.